If you pluck the string of an electric guitar, it makes no sound, right? It's only when the body of the guitar records the shape of the string and plays it back through an amplifier that you hear sound. Similarly, when let's say two black holes orbit and collide, they ring the three-dimensional drum of space-time. It's like a, the whole space rings like a drum. I am so thrilled to introduce tonight's event with Jenna Levin discussing her new book, Black Hole Blues and other songs from outer space. Jenna Levin is a professor of physics and astronomy at Barnard College of Columbia University. She has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and has contributed to an understanding of black holes, the cosmology of extra dimensions, and gravitational waves in the shape of space-time. So I did want to talk about the discovery. How many people heard on February 11th the announcement of what people touted as the discovery of the century. How many people heard of the, about the announcement? How many people sat wrapped while they, it was being explained? Okay, same number of people. How many people within about an hour were like, yeah, I don't get it? <laughs> okay, that's probably all of you. Still, no, it's, it's not an insult. It's just an incredibly subtle and difficult subject. When the Higgs particle was discovered, how many people heard about the Higgs discovery? You know, it's hard to understand the role the Higgs plays in physics, but it's not hard to understand that a particle was created by smashing two things together, right? You smash two things together, you make debris, you made a particle. The gravitational wave discovery is so esoteric. Here's how esoteric it is. In 1915, Einstein writes down his general theory of relativity. It's his lifetime accomplishment. That year, Carl Schwarzschild, who's a German infantry soldier, writes him from the, from, it's actually the Russian front, I was going to say the Prussian front, but it was the Russian front during World War I and says, I've been reading the Prussian Academy of Sciences between calculating ballistic trajectories, as you do, and, um, and I've been thinking about solutions to your equations, and he wrote down the solution for the existence of black holes. Now, nobody called them black holes at the time. But it initiated a correspondence between Einstein and Schwarzschild. And Einstein said to him, the most important topic for me to turn to at this time, isn't these, you know, this, math this mathematical solution is beautiful, but nothing will allow something like that to form. So the most important topic is the existence of gravitational waves. And he says to Schwarzschild, I don't really think they exist. So let me tell you what they are. The idea that Einstein comes up with is that space-time around a massive object is curved. Now, how do I know that? If I were to take like this book and I was to throw it, was that bad grammar? I speak pretty good English. I write pretty well. I was to throw it. I were to, uh, yeah, I were to throw. Uh, if I threw that book, would it travel a straight line? It would travel a curved path. It's that simple for Einstein. What, the Earth is not pulling on the object. The object is falling freely around the Earth. It must be that the space around the Earth is curved. I mean, it's, it's really intuitive, actually, if you think about it. And if I threw the book harder, it would take a straighter path, but still curved. And if I threw it hard enough, it would actually go into orbit around the Earth, and it would be a circle. It would be falling all the time, but always just clearing the horizon. And so Einstein comes up with this intuition for a curved space-time, but it takes him a long time to mathematize it. By 1915, he does. Now, here's where gravitational waves come in. If I'm to move the Earth, those curves must follow the Earth, right? The International Space Station is in a circular orbit around the Earth. If the Earth moves, surely the circle has to move with it. But nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So the waves in the shape of space-time must communicate to the rest of the universe that the Earth has moved and relocated, and that the circular orbit of the International Space Station has relocated with the Earth. Those very waves are the gravitational waves. Now, Einstein told Schwarzschild in 1916 he didn't think that they were real. Okay, it's really interesting. And then in 1936, 7, he writes a paper saying, again, he goes back and forth on this for a while, he writes a paper saying gravitational waves do not exist. Between acceptance of the publication and press, he sneaks in a different version that says that they do. 
<laughs> and it goes on like this for a while. Somebody says, you know, Professor Einstein, you have to be very careful. Your name is going to be on these papers. And he thinks, my name is on plenty of wrong papers, you know. <laughs> um, you know he said about himself, when I was a student, I was no Einstein. Um, <laughs> So this is going on for decades. This is such a subtle, esoteric problem. If you felt after 15 minutes of exposure to the announcement of the discovery of the century that you didn't understand it, you shouldn't feel bad, right? It took Einstein decades to feel secure in the knowledge that gravitational waves were real. By the late 60s, Ray Weiss, who's a dear friend and a beautiful person and works down the street at MIT, um, was a young professor at MIT, he was just hired, and started a gravity research program, and they asked him to teach a class in this complex subject of general relativity. And he tells me what I knew about general relativity you could stick in this finger, you know? But he says yes. And, because, um, you know, he has this whole gravity program. He can't say, I don't understand general relativity. And he describes that he was bumbling. He says, I was bumbling, but the students didn't walk out because the whole while, he was trying to imagine, how would you measure space-time? How would I understand this in a visceral way, in a physical way? And he dreams of this experiment. Let's say the sun blew up, and waves in the shape of space-time traveled eight minutes to get to the Earth to tell us that the sun wasn't where it used to be, and that our orbit needs to adjust on the curves in space-time. And he imagines, what if I hung mirrors that would bob on the wave as it passed, and I shine, you know, I, I put a laser between them, and the laser would keep track of the location of the mirrors, and it would tell me if the mirrors were bobbing on the wave. This is much like something bobbing on the ocean. And, um, and uh, he called it a haiku. It turns out there aren't clocks precise enough to do that. So he went one step further. He said, imagine I made an L-shaped instrument so that mirrors at the ends of the L bobbed in the wave, and I, I put the laser shining between the mirrors. When the laser recombined back at the apex, if the mirrors didn't move, it would recombine perfectly, and if the mirrors oscillated on the wave like things floating on the ocean, it would recombine imperfectly, and you could measure that. And, um, and he called it a haiku. He said you would think nothing would come of it. He started to build an, an instrument that was one and a half meters long in the Plywood Palace. Do you all know about the Plywood Palace? This is part of your local history. The Plywood Palace, otherwise known as Building 20, was a shoddy structure thrown up on the MIT campus during the war effort. It was meant to encourage research in radar and microwave engineering, and it was meant to be up for 10 years at most and torn down. It was a crappy structure that inspired its inhabitants to violate it liberally. <laughs> and they were so inspired by being able to punch holes through walls and tap things from the pipes and puncture holes through the ceiling that nine Nobel Prizes came out of the Plywood Palace. Possibly a tenth <laughs> with this discovery. And uh, Ray started to build his one and a half meter little machine in the Plywood Palace, dreaming of the sun blowing up and oscillating the mirrors. And one of his colleagues said, literally said, I'd do better looking out the window. <laughs> and it was true. He, he realized he couldn't detect anything from the sun blowing up. And that's because gravity is incredibly weak. You know, the whole earth is pulling on me and I have no problem like resisting the earth. That's crazy. Gravity is phenomenally weak. And at this time, early 70s, people didn't even know black holes were real, let alone that gravitational waves were real, right? So what could possibly cause space-time to ring energetically enough that it would be detectable? And, and people weren't sure there was anything. So Ray, uh, tries to get some money for his little machine and, and is turned down by the National Science Foundation. And he finds out that people in Germany have heard about his idea and are building a better version and it's bigger and it's technologically more sophisticated and they're great scientists and they're great engineers and he's got nothing. He's got no money. He has no backing from MIT. No offense, MIT. He's got, now he has backing from MIT, trust me. <laughs> and, uh, and he thinks to himself, I'm going to miss out. Now I have to tell you there's something else about the machine and that is that it is not like a telescope. If you think about everything we know about astronomy, we really know about things that come to us from light. We take pictures of the sky, right? The Hubble pictures, pictures in all these different wave bands. We have this kind of silent movie of the universe. It traces back 
14 billion years, it's 92 billion years across, light years, sorry, rather, across. And, um, but it's a silent movie. Gravitational waves are not light. It's like a ringing drum of space-time itself. I liken the instrument Ray dreamt up to um, an electric guitar. How many people play electric guitar? More of you play electric guitar, I know that you just don't want to admit it. Um, if you pluck the string of an electric guitar, it makes no sound, right? It's only when the body of the guitar records the shape of the string and plays it back through an amplifier that you hear sound. Similarly, when let's say two black holes orbit and collide, they ring the three-dimensional drum of space-time. It's like a, the whole space rings like a drum. And LIGO is like the body of the musical instrument. It records the ringing shape of the drum by these mirrors. And it plays it back through conventional amplifiers. The, the experimentalists literally listen to the detector in the control room. <laughs> they listen to it. So this is not um, a telescope. It's different. It's like a recording. It's a recording of the sounds from space. So Ray's at this point where he says to me, you know, when I was a kid, I had one ambition in life, and it was to make music easier to hear. It was to better, make a better circuit for FM systems so people could listen to the Philharmonic in my living room. And he had this dream of this crazy cosmic recording device to record the sounds of space. This was very integrated in who he was. And he said, I was about to lose out. I had no funding. I did not have the support of my colleagues. And he says to me, the next big event was I met Kip. So Kip Thorne is an iconic astrophysicist who at the age of 30 was already um, a professor at Caltech and super accomplished. And I feel like Kip dreamt of something bigger even than himself. And they began this campaign. Now we're going to fast forward 50 years. Everyone thinks that on February 11th, when they heard the announcement, these people just turned on the machine and it succeeded. Ray is in his 80s. He is still walking the, the tubes, you know, looking for wasps. It turns out urine from the wasps corrodes the steel, <laughs> stainless steel, <laughs> causes punctures in the vacuums. You know, he's there all the time. He's working on experiments. I cannot tell you how many times people have said to me, we better ask Ray, you know, what's going on. So Ray says to me in August 2015, the advanced instrument has just been completely installed. Machines are locked. They know they've reached this experimentally remarkable achievement. The instrument is not one and a half meters. It's four kilometers long because, as they said, with one and a half meters, you'd do better looking out the window. <laughs> So they made the machine four kilometers long. There's two instruments, one on a remote site in Louisiana. It's not as remote as one would like because they're logging forests out there, and that's not so good, but they've compensated for it, and to their advantage, actually. And there's another instrument in Hanford, Washington. Each one spans four kilometers. And um, it's a billion dollars later. And now instead of just Ray and Kip and another person, Ron Drever, who's a Scottish physicist who joined the team, um, there's a team of a thousand people around the world who um, work on this committedly. And um, Ray says to me in August, you know, if we don't discover black holes, this thing is a failure. <laughs> Which was part of the inspiration for the title, right? Black Hole Blues. I was like, oh, there's my title. <laughs> um, and uh, people told me, you know, it'll be 2018 before there's a discovery. 2018, 2020. And um, instead, in September, um, September 13th, 2015, they turn the instruments on, which just means that they're locked, which is no mean feat. It's not like flicking a switch. It's a big operation to get the laser locked so that it's really hitting the mirrors and everything's where it's supposed to be. But they decide that they're not ready yet, so they postpone the science runs. They're not ready yet. They're not in any big hurry. It's going to be 2018 before they make a discovery, after all. They're not in any big hurry. So they're interrupting the machine. Ray says, on Sunday night, I was there looking for radio interference. Luckily, my wife told me I had to come home. You know, so he gets on a plane, he goes back to Maine. Graduate students and scientists are working hard on the instrument. They're interrupting it. They're banging on it. Um, it's constantly falling out of lock, and they're purposely, purposefully doing this. And uh, by 4 in the morning, Louisiana time, 2 in the morning, Washington State, everybody just decides they're exhausted. They put down their tools. They go home. Within the span of an hour, 
The gravitational wave from the collision of two black holes 1.3 billion years ago was emitted at the time that multi-celled organisms were fossilizing on the Earth, came from the southern sky, hitting a nearby nebula at the time Einstein was born and you know, re sort of reveling about the notions of space-time, hitting uh, the outer solar system in the hours that Ray was disturbing the machine and taking it offline looking for radio interference. Uh, eventually rings at about 4.50 a.m. the machine in Louisiana and is recorded. Seven milliseconds later, skimming across the continent, it rings the machine in Hanford, Washington and is recorded. By the time Ray wakes up, 8 something a.m. East Coast time, it's billions of kilometers away. But he looks at the logs and he thinks, what the hell is that? <laughs> he sees in the logs a signal candidate event. And, um, and it was the first human procured recording of any sound from space. I liken it to a sound not just because this is a recording device, but because if you were floating nearby those two black holes, your ear could technically ring in response. You literally could hear it ring. I mean, I'm not swearing to this because it's not an experiment I'm willing to perform. <laughs> but if you were nearby the two colliding black holes, it's conceivable that your eardrum would ring in response and you would literally hear it. Um, so it's very close to a sound. So it's the first human procured recording from the sounds of space. And it was the collision of two black holes 1.3 billion years ago. One of them was 29 times the mass of the sun. One of them was about 35 times the mass of the sun. When they collided, we only saw the final <coughs> one-fifth of a second. I shouldn't say saw, recorded the final one-fifth of a second. It was too quiet before that final moment. So it's like mallets on a drum banging on space time and not until they're going near the speed of light, each one a couple hundred kilometers across and they collide, was it loud enough that even for these remarkably sensitive instruments to record? It settled down and went quiet as a black hole about 62 times the mass of the sun. It was the single most energetic event we've ever recorded since the Big Bang. The power that came out in complete darkness in the gravitational waves exceeds the power of all the stars shining in the observable universe combined. It was absolutely not only a remarkable technological achievement, but it's the first time we've ever been able to record something utterly dark. It's the first time we've ever recorded two black holes colliding. And if you heard the news a couple of weeks ago, they announced another event that they heard on um, Boxing Day on December 26. Mm -hmm. So um, I would actually just like to like have a moment of respect for the experiment. We'll give them a little applause. <laughs> so, yes, <yeah, see> <laughs> So I should clarify that I'm not actually in the experiment. I'm a theoretical physicist. I did get my degree from MIT, but I was working on more particle physics sort of things. And I'm not in the experiment. I'm not an experimentalist. I've been known to ruin boiling water more than once. And I'm rarely allowed into a lab. I was very grateful they let me anywhere near the instrument at all. Um, so what happened in my um, path to writing this book was very much kind of a, a moment of admiration for the physicality of the experiment. My work is very pen on paper and it's very mathematical and I truly believe in what we're doing, but it seemed like something else entirely to build something, right? It's a whole other level of commitment and a whole other level of um, sort of intensity of belief in the idea. And, um, and I just became very enamored of the experimentalists and their accomplishment. And so the book really tracks, it's like a climbing Mount Everest story. When I wrote the book, we didn't know if they would succeed. And uh, I do have an epilogue about the actual detection, but I love that the book was written without the knowledge of the success because I think it really conveys the sort of intensity and insanity that's involved with a scientific endeavor like this. And I think it really epitomizes Ray's statement, you know, if we don't detect black holes, this thing is a failure. That's quite a thing to say at 83, after you've been doing this for 50 years. <laughs> but it's an honest thing to say. Um, so thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions at this point. The universe is 14 billion years old, but how do we know that it translates to 92 billion light years across? That's because the universe is expanding at a particular rate over the history of the universe that we can track. So we know it was expanding at a certain rate in the early history, and that the expansion of the universe has accelerated, has picked up pace over the past little while. Like right now, we know that the universe is actually getting faster and faster in its expansion, and that's the confirmation of the existence of dark matter. So we have to calculate it. It's not a simple equation. 
dimension. It's not like it is in flat space. I simply say, if it's been 10 billion years, light has traveled 10 billion light years. But in an expanding universe, the expansion of the universe makes that bigger. So even though the universe is only 14 billion years old, it's bigger than 14 billion light years in each direction, which would be 28. It's actually 92 if you, if you do the formal calculation. I mean, 92 might not be exactly right. I mean, the numbers change as we understand dark energy better. Would it be more fair to say that the observable universe has a diameter of 92 billion years? Absolutely. It would be more accurate to say the observable universe has a diameter of 92 billion light years because if you read my first book, <laughs> How the Universe Got Its Spots, it's on the question of whether or not the universe is infinite or finite. All we know is the light travel time and the light travel distance. Right. We don't know if the universe extends beyond that infinitely. And in fact, even in the, the uh, observable universe, we're not 100% sure the light hasn't made more than one trip around. Right. So if you imagine you're here in Cambridge and you were to walk in a straight line, and just never turn left or right, and never slow down, you would eventually come back exactly where you're standing. It's possible that the universe itself is finite and connected in a funny way so that the light has traveled more than once around. Um, but it's very unlikely. I'll, you know, if we look at the universe, we cannot see any evidence on the large scale. That the, when we look for it, and we take it seriously, yeah. we can't see any evidence that the light has wrapped around more than once. But we do take seriously the idea that there are extra dimensions beyond north, south, east, west, up and down, and that those dimensions are curled up very small. And so it might be that when the universe is born, it's born democratically with t like 10 spatial dimensions, all of which are wrapped up, but for some peculiar reason, only three become large. Although and so this is one of the intriguing questions. Why would six stay tightly small right. and three become large? Although even as we speak, there's no observational data that says there's more than three spatial dimensions. Well, I have a theory that dark energy could come from the extraspatial dimensions, so maybe dark energy is an observation of extraspatial dimensions, or maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> those are all, those are both very valid possibilities. Okay. Um, but you know, I'm not attached to these theories. Like if it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay. We're just grasping at straws at this stage. The second part of the question yeah. was, analogies are great, vital to understand things, Yeah. but this is one scientific uh, experiment, if you will, that did receive uh, wide publicity. It was widely reported even mm -hmm. on cable news conference. Yeah, it was amazing. So, I did Al Jazeera. Yeah, so it was amazing. The thing is, is it fair to say, and, if, and I just want to know if I'm right or wrong about mm -hmm. this, that I, I think that right now in this country you have millions of, let's say, laymen, casual mm -hmm. jurors, walking around thinking, oh, scientists actually recorded sound, where in fact it's an it's no more sound than if you plug in headphones into a radio telescope. Oh, it is more sound than that. Is it? Yes, and I'll tell you, I understand what you're saying. So I, if I can translate. So the Cassini mission, which went by you know, Saturn's rings and things like this, recorded electromagnetic radiation, which is a form of light, right. in the radio band, and simply opted to translate it into sound, which you can do all the time. It's just like a cool thing you can do with filters. This is technically different in the following sense. If you were floating near the black holes and they were colliding, you have to put yourself at an optimal distance. They, they actually ring space-time in the human auditory range. Your eardrum, as a mechanism, at least it's conceivable, okay, I haven't studied it, the anatomy in detail, but at least it's conceivable would ring in response, even in the absence of air you would hear the black holes. You wouldn't see them. Okay, your eye is not a detector of gravitational waves. Okay. You would technically hear them, at least conceivably. It's hypothetically possible. Okay. And so in that sense, it's much closer to sound. It's much more like the electric guitar. So if I unplug an electric guitar and I play it, there's some sense in which you know what I mean when I say it's making a sound, even though I have to plug it into the amplifier okay. to finalize it. So I do think it's much deeper than a... Than a than a crude sonification of data. But I read somewhere that Stephen Hawking said that the mathematics of the black hole looks like you get it by understanding that it's a two-dimensional thing that is then projected into a three-dimensional. Yeah. And that sounds like a black hole then is evidence that the universe is a hologram. Yeah, this is really due to Lenny Susskind and Gerard de Tuft. Yeah. Are you asking if that's true? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, the universe really has the possibility of being a whole yeah. because the mathematics is that it's two dimensions. It's very, very important stuff is what I can say now, and it's clearly the case. It's a really deep stuff. The idea is this, that the event horizon of the black hole, which is the region beyond which light cannot escape, um, which is the shadow of the black hole, um, that that area measures the amount of information that can be stored in it, not the volume, okay? It doesn't, the, the amount of information you can store, and this is due to technical reasons, goes like the area, not the volume. So the argument is if you can encode everything on the area, that's a lot like what a hologram does. A hologram takes the information and puts it on a surface, but it looks very three-dimensional. Now, in, in our reality, we think, ah, but there's more information in three dimensions that you just don't capture in the hologram. You know, I've got an inside, I've got a heart and guts and this kind of stuff. But in, in, in black hole theory, you can prove you cannot have more information in the volume that you can encode in the area which makes it sound very much like a real hologram, as though, there, as though nature forbids more information than can be encoded in the hologram. And that's due to, uh, again, Gerard Tuft, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and Lenny Susskind, who's an absolutely, incredibly um, fascinating visionary guy. Um, as far as we can tell, that may well be true, but this is really forefront stuff that's in hot debate, and, and it's not resolved. A lot of other reasons to believe that the universe is a hologram, that well, we'd like to be able to do the same thing in cosmology. We'd like to be able to say that if I look out at the universe and I see that it's expanding and I have an observable horizon, which is what was sort of brought up earlier, that all of the information in the entire volume of space can be encoded on the surface of this observable. Similar kinds of arguments. It hasn't been effectively translated to cosmology yet. That, that is something that everyone would like to do, but hasn't. Have, have not done yet successfully. How yeah. did they know it was 1.3 billion years ago and it was two black holes? Uh, plus or minus a couple hundred million years. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give or take a um, If you imagine hearing your iPhone, um, you know the ringtone so well that you can tell if it's far away, right? And um, similarly, we know we can predict incredibly well, and this took decades of hard work on the theorists' behalf, um, decades of hard work to be able to model the ringtone, which actually you can get on LIGO.org for your phone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so that we, you know, when they first got the recording, it looked a lot like black hole collision, but it took them time to analyze and get the masses right and fit it. So basically what you're fitting is sort of the, the, the the, the note that's being played depends on the masses. How loud it is depends on the masses and the distance. And you can fit these things to tell if it's two black holes that are 10 solar masses each and closer or 30 solar masses and farther. And you can fit it within a certain error. And, and we don't know the distance to better than a few, a few hundred million years. We don't. But, you know, that's not bad. We don't care so much about the distance. I mean, we might later as we get further along because it'll mean we're hearing them further in the past if they're further away, and that might be relevant for us understanding the systems. But, but, um, but it's, a pretty, it's, a, it's a pretty easy thing to lock in after you know, several decades of hard work. Are the speeds of the collision always the same when black holes are moving through space? And if not, then how do you determine their mass because the rings of different masses should be? Yeah, the speed, um, so the black hole mass determines the size. So these black holes were a couple of hundred kilometers across, which is pretty small, right? And they're, they're nearly, they're roughly 30 times the mass of the sun, but they fit into a couple hundred kilometers, you know, seriously intense objects. And, um, and so that means that that, that you can tell how fast they're going around each other because they're, really they're really close together. If you had much, much bigger black holes, in some sense they'd be going slower and they'd, they'd be further apart. Um, so you can tell both how fast they're going and how, far, how many orbits they take. That also helps you determine their sizes, right? So if you think about it, <laughs> sorry? The ring you're able to do. Yeah, because uh, basically it's like mallets on a drum. It sort of oscillates once every full, it oscillates actually twice every full circle. So it tells us how fast they're orbiting, which tells us um, how close together they are, which tells us how small they are, right? And that tells us their masses. So, um, so the question, more abstract question is, can I reconstruct the motion size of the mallets from the sound I hear of the ringing drum? And the answer is yes. Now there are some things we can't tell very well. 
But the masses in the distance we can tell pretty well. They, they're also spinning, and that's harder to, to determine. What would be needed to visualize a gravitational wave? So you would rather visualize it than hear it. What? Um, if you, uh, do you have a stereo system? Do you ever see the wave, like if they play the bass? You know how they do, that's, a, that's the same thing, okay? So if you look at the data in a picture, it looks like what you would look at if you're looking at GarageBand and you're turning down the bass. It's exactly what it looks like. It's like a wave, and if it's loud, it's got high amplitude, and if it's high frequency, high notes, it's oscillating faster, and if it's low notes, it's oscillating slower, and that's exactly what it looks like. When they first told me about the detection, they showed me a picture. They didn't play me the sound, right? And they showed me a picture, which is exactly what you would look at in GarageBand if you were looking at the bass. And what was amazing was not only did you see the black holes collide, which was meaning they got louder and higher frequency, higher notes. That's why it's a chirp. It goes whoop, and it scoops up because they're getting faster and closer together. It's that increases the frequency, just like two mallets on a drum. And then you see them ring down to one black hole, which is stunning. You see them collide, and it makes this blobby thing, which then sheds away its imperfections and becomes a flawless black hole. Black holes are not like anything else in the universe. They're more like fundamental particles. And the black hole that settles down after the collision is perfectly flawless, and it goes quiet. And you can, you can actually see all of this in the waveform. It's pretty crazy. What do you think of Tegmark's mathematical universe hypothesis? Sorry, Tegmark's? Ma Max Tegmark's? Is Max here? <laughs> <laughs> Max is a friend of mine. Um, I think when Max says something like, so Max Tegmark is a professor from MIT and a colleague and a friend, and he says things like, um, objects are mathematical. What do I mean by the electron? I mean it, a list of its mathematical properties. That's what I mean by the electron. I would agree with that. Absolutely. I don't know what else I would mean, right? So the electron is also a fundamental particle. It has a specific mass, a specific spin, a specific charge. There are no two electrons that are even slightly different. They're absolutely identical. This is also true about black holes. You cannot say that about anything else in the universe. If I, you can't say that about a star. You can't say that about a book. You can't say that about two copies of my book, that they are identical, right? But two black holes with the same mass, charge, and spin are absolutely indistinguishable. It doesn't matter if you made them out of copies of the, encyclope you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica or if you made them out of um, um, rhinoceri. Is that the right plural? I don't know why that came out. Who knows? Who knows how the mind works? Um, you absolutely could not tell the difference, or antimatter for that. So, um, so in that sense, they're closer to electrons than they are to stars. Speak a little bit to what comes next now that with LIGO. Yeah. So, um, amazingly, not only did LIGO uh, detect a gravitational wave before 2018, it detected black holes, which everyone told me would be last. So um, what's next for LIGO is to do old-fashioned astronomy like we do with any other telescope. So we're starting to understand the black holes were bigger than we expected, and we're going to try to figure out why that is. Um, there are more of them than we expected. Of the three notable events in the first science run, they all appear, uh, as far as we can tell, to be black hole collisions. We've, we've heard nothing else. So not only are they the first, they seem to be all that we're detecting. Now that might just be that LIGO is working better in low notes. And as the experiment improves in the higher notes, we'll start to hear s neutron stars collide, which are dead stars that didn't quite become black holes. We might hear neutron stars with little mountains on them, making monotones as they sort of paddle space time. We might hear stars explode. We might hear something we've never imagined before. So if you were to ask me what would I hope, I would hope that we're going to detect something that we have no idea what it is. <laughs> and that's every scientist's real naughty little hope, <laughs> right? Like when they discovered the Higgs, people were like, yay, we did it. And they were like, oh, is that it? <laughs> so it's sort of the same thing with LIGO. We really want to, you know, when Galileo pointed a telescope at Saturn, he did not foresee quasars and galaxies colliding. And so that's what we hope. It'll open up the universe for us. Less than 5% of what we know about the universe is luminous. Okay, the rest of it's dark. So the aspiration is that maybe we're going to record this soundtrack um, to this silent movie that we've, we've mapped. 
How did you negotiate being there as a writer versus being a professional? That's a really good question. I um, started out writing a book about black holes, which is my bread and butter. I, I teach black holes all the time. I, I research black holes. I've written many papers about them. I literally, I, I gave a TED talk in 2011, and when I came off the stage, somebody said to me, I heard you're writing a book about black holes. And I was like, it's my agent here. <laughs> Sure enough, you know, he was already hawking the book. And I thought, all right, I could do that in my sleep. Instead, I ended up doing something really different, a much more narrative book where these guys are like characters in a novel, really. And it was very hard for me to, to redirect. You know, you, it's a lot like science. You set out with a certain hypothesis, and then you have to realize that there's something more interesting in the other direction. And um, and it was really painful for me. It's why my book was two years late, and it was also why it was perfectly timed with the discovery. <laughs> so had I not been two years late, you all wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, and it was hard because I, you know, I have a long-term relationship with a lot of the scientists on the team, and, and I, I didn't want to suddenly become the writer and not the scientist. And, um, and all I can say is that was difficult. But, um, but the LIGO team has been very good to me and very generous and, and spent time taking me around the sites and, um, and uh, you know, it's a long-term relationship to cultivate. I mean, I've cultivated the relationship for a very, very long time and, and uh, I'm just relieved nobody stabbed me in the eye. <laughs> and that's a perfect note to end on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. GE being the green company it is, um, I think there's an opportunity for them to do something really creative and visionary here, perhaps set an example for uh, what the rest of the Boston waterfront could be doing. Um, presumably their lawyers have checked the maps and, uh, and know where they're going to locate.